Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again today. I am Trace. This is episode 5 of 5 in our series on blood. I hope you've stuck around for all five episodes. If you haven't, go back, check them out. They're really great. We learned about what blood is, the component parts, disorders of the blood, and how to cure those disorders. And then yesterday we talked about blood types and how it's important that you could donate some blood. But today we're going to talk about why that's important and how there might be a time when we can just make it in a lab or in a factory. So make sure you subscribe so you get all of our episodes of Test Tube Plus. Let us know down in the comments how you think we're doing. Make sure you come find us over on Twitter. You can find the show at Test Tube. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. We want to have blood substitutes, right? We want synthetic blood. We don't want to have to suck blood out of all of these different people in order to save all of these other people. That would be ideal. When we say synthetic blood, we're not talking about like a recipe for blood on like a horror movie set, right? We're talking about literally scientifically developing blood that could potentially replace human blood when needed. And that would be great for so many different reasons. Obviously, when there's a crisis of some kind, a tsunami, a, an attack of some kind, a war, you do need blood. and. There is a major worldwide blood shortage, historically, kind of all the time. Pretty much any war or natural disaster results in an increased need for blood transfusions, for blood for surgery and accidents, and people making sure that they just have enough to get through the surgery that they need to live. In January of 2016, the American Red Cross declared an urgent need for donations because of a shortage that they were experiencing because of winter weather. People weren't going to donate blood because it was a really harsh winter on the East Coast. There were 1,700 fewer blood drives, 50,000 fewer donations, and blood is needed every single day. The American Red Cross claims blood is needed every two seconds. 36,000 units of blood are needed every day in the U.S. 13.6 million units are collected each year. So if you do the math on that. 37,260 units of blood have to be donated every day in order for making that work, that math work out. I mean, that seems like a pretty stable balance of blood supply and demand, right? But you're not taking into account the different types of blood and where that blood is being donated. If everyone donated blood equally, there would be a lot more blood in New York and LA and Chicago than there would be in Nebraska, right? And on top of that, you'd need to make sure the blood type matches. Of the 13.6 million units collected every year, Ben Bowman, CEO of General Blood, told Forbes 1.3 million pints are spoiled or are wasted. How does he mean wasted or spoiled? Well, blood is difficult to transport, it doesn't last forever, and there's this whole blood economy that goes into that. You know, you might donate blood to a private organization, you think you're doing good, but, you, I mean, you are, but then they sell that blood and they have to ship it somewhere so it can be used. I think it was on Radio Lab. I looked it up earlier. Clear eyes, full veins, can't lose, something like that. Definitely check out that one. It's really, really good. It's crazy complicated, though, the blood economy. Donated blood, though, part of the reason it spoils is because it can only be stored for 42 days. So if you donate blood in South Carolina and a tsunami occurs in Washington, one, they'd have to find a way to get that blood to Washington to use it. But two, you'd have to hope that that tsunami happens within 42 days of your donation or your donation don't get used by that. Substitutes might help extend shelf life for up to three years. There's stabilizers, buffers, there's different means of refrigeration and temperatures, uh, ways to store the blood, you know, to kind of keep it moving and, and keep it alive. It's a living substance, right? Those cells are alive. But when you're transporting that blood, it becomes difficult when you get away from places with great infrastructure. Uh, if you're in a battlefield or if you're in the middle of nowhere, whatever part of the world you're in, it can be more and more difficult to transport this living substance. And as we've mentioned throughout this series, not all blood is the same. And we're not talking about this time blood types. What if blood is donated and it's infected? 15 million units of blood are transfused annually without being tested for HIV and hepatitis. This is more common outside of the United States, but there are other diseases which we should be worried about that can be transmitted through blood, like mad cow or creutzfeldt jakob disease, and it's pretty impractical to test all of the blood that gets donated for all of these things before it gets used. Of course, donated blood is also constricted to certain blood types and people who are healthy enough to do so. So there are people whose blood is needed, but they may not be able to donate. So wouldn't it be nice 
after all of that, if we could just go make some blood, you know, something universal that we could donate to anybody. But sadly, we don't have that right now. There are well-accepted oxygen-carrying blood substitutes, which you would need if, say, you needed a red blood cell transfusion. However, there are no well-accepted oxygen-carrying blood substitutes, none, which you would need if you wanted more red blood cells. You could replace your plasma, some of it, with a non-blood volume expander. It helps fill up your veins, like a plasma replacement. It literally fills in the circulatory system. This avoids the risk of disease transmission and immune risk suppression. And it also addresses some concerns people have, Jehovah's Witnesses and other religious groups, of getting blood transfusions. But there are people working on getting oxygen-carrying blood substitutes, essentially synthetic red blood cells. The primary function of blood is to transport oxygen and remove CO2 from our cells throughout the body. Most synthetics being tested are classified into two categories, hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers and perfluorocarbon-based oxygen carriers. So HBOCs and PFCs. In HBOCs, they use hemoglobin. Talked about it earlier, it's a great word. The membrane of the red blood cell is removed in this process, and in doing so, it removes something called isomer 2,3-DPG. The hemoglobin can transport the oxygen throughout the body, but without the isomer 2,3-DPG, it has a difficult time releasing the oxygen molecule. So it has it, and it's kind of like a, like a bloody tease, just drives by, doesn't let it go. Biomedical engineers are trying to develop artificial red blood cells that will encapsulate actual hemoglobins. The red blood cell would be synthetic, but the hemoglobin wouldn't be, and the type wouldn't matter, and it would hopefully be able to release <laughs> the oxygen, because that's kind of a big part of it. Another way to create HBOCs is to use a chemical bond and literally just hook two hemoglobins together. Once you do that, it strengthens the hemoglobin, it lasts longer in the circulatory system, then it would only need a molecule that mimics that isomer, and it can be linked in, and boom. I mean, I mean I, kind of. More research is needed. Yes. At least in the U.S. According to the FDA, HBOCs tend to build up toxic levels in the blood, and they can cause high blood pressure, they can harm kidneys, and hurt other organs. So HBOC is not the best. That's one method. The other method is the PFBOC, or more simply PFC, the perfluorocarbon-based oxygen carrier. And these are liquid fluorinated hydrocarbon compounds. Let me break that down a little bit for you. Fluorine, hydrogen, carbon, it's a little chain. It carry dissolved oxygen, essentially, is what they're trying to do. Similarly, it's essentially simulating hemoglobin. They need to figure out, though, how to make these things, the PFCs, compatible with humans. They require emulsification because they don't easily mix with actual blood. An emulsion is a liquid suspended inside of another liquid. In 1989, Japan manufactured the first FDA-approved PFBOC, or PFC, and they didn't really have a lot of success with it. It was complicated to use, it had some side effects, and that's really it. Those two groups are the only way that we've tried so far to make this synthetic blood work. We can't synthesize it yet. But there are less recognized alternatives for blood, like hyperbranched polymer-protected porphyrins, or plastic blood, pretty much. It's currently being developed at the University of Sheffield, and it uses plastic molecules with an iron atom core. Sounds familiar, right? Iron, hemoglobin, transports oxygen throughout the body. Sounds pretty natural. That might work. We still have to figure that one out in the future. Stem cells from umbilical cords and adult donors can be used to create red blood cell substitutes. They're cultured in solution, it takes about three weeks, and they can create about 10,000 red blood cells from a single stem cell, which sounds awesome, but since it takes a month and blood only lasts about 120 days, you have to really stay on your schedule. And it's only 10,000 red blood cells from a single stem cell, so you have to create a lot of red blood cells. The conversion on top of that is only about 50% successful. So again, we're, we've, got, we've got some problems. <laughs> we need to work on these things. Hopefully we can find out more about this when synthetic blood comes out in 2017. That's their planned release date. There's also cloning blood, one of the first stories I ever talked about on discoverynews.com. Our website is about cloning blood. It requires stem cells that can be scaled up to industrial levels and they can use it in the military uh, and it can be made type O. So you just clone other people's blood and you come out 
with this great product, except it came out in 2008 using embryonic stem cells, which were much more controversial. And some of the first stem cells we started using, people don't really like the idea of taking embryonic stem cells from humans and using them to grow blood. So not the best plan there either. The common conclusion we came to here is that a lot of research and testing is being done on creating blood substitutes, but we don't really have a synthetic blood substitute for use in America today. So the best plan that you can really have is to take care of your blood, right? As we've kind of said a couple of times, blood is what keeps you alive. It's your highway system. It's your waterway system. It's what transports all your nutrients, all your oxygen. It transports your cells that can heal you and can fight off infections. Blood is super important. And yet we never really think about it unless we cut ourselves, do we? You're not sitting around thinking about your blood. I mean, maybe you are right now, but most of the time you don't think about it. On top of that, it gives our face color, gives our body color, like our lips are red because blood cells are closer to the skin. You can see the redness. They turn blue when we don't have oxygen in them because deoxygenated blood changes color. You know, our blood is such a big part of being human and we should kind of love it. It's kind of fitting that color of love is also red. Thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus this week, everyone. I'm Trace. Come find me on Twitter, at Trace Dominguez. Come find the show, at Test Tube. Let us know down in the comments how you felt about blood. Were you skeeved out by it earlier on, and now you kind of love it? Is it the other way around? I hope not. Let us know. And also, thanks a lot for watching this week. If you haven't seen all of our episodes, check them all out. We've got five of them this week. Really awesome. We're going to have more next week, so make sure you subscribe so you get all of those. And thanks a lot for tuning in. Really, I appreciate it. If you haven't shared this show with your friends, please, we ask you to do so. We would love that. It's what helps us keep going here and helps us keep making this great show for you. And thanks so much to all of the fans who've reached out on Twitter. So great to hear how much you guys love it. Uh, just a sidebar, a little, you know, housekeeping. We're working on getting the podcast section fixed. I know some of them are showing up. We've found that if you uh, find them on your phone and not on the actual iTunes software on your computer it works a lot better so that's how i listen to it so thanks a lot for watching we'll see you later